Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number 22. To gain your own voice, you have to forget about having it heard. Alan Ginsberg. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Audible. If you guys want to get a free screenwriting audiobook, or filmmaking audiobook for that matter, head on over to FreeFilmBook.com and download your free screenwriting book from Audible. Now, today on the show, we have Jill Chamberlain, who is the author of The Nutshell Technique. She is a veteran script consultant, and during her journeys as a script consultant, she found that 99% of all first-time screenwriters really had no idea how to tell a story. And what the 99% did instead was present a situation. So Jill set out to write The Nutshell Technique in order to explain the difference. And in the technique... She identifies eight dynamic interconnected elements that are required for a successful story. I had a wonderful time talking to Jill. We talked shop. We talked about the business. And, of course, we talked about story and screenwriting. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jill Chamberlain. I'd like to welcome to the show Jill Chamberlain. Thank you so much for being on the show, Jill. My pleasure. So how can you, um, first of all, how, can you share with us how you got into the business in the first place? Sure. Um, you know, I was a frustrated screenwriter. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was getting a note, something along the lines of, I don't understand why this character is on this journey now. Mm-hmm. Um, and another version of that note would be something along the lines of, you're failing to tell a story. What you're presenting is a situation, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of a devastating note to, <laughs> to hear, but no one could explain to me the difference. Um, and, and none of the books could explain the difference. Um, so I started deconstructing movies, probably partially as a procrastination technique. Obviously. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, we're always looking for those, but, and also cause I was truly blocked and I didn't know how to get around this problem. And I had had some good training um, at Columbia University and also some private programs in New York City uh, that dealt with aspects of this, but no one was putting it all together. Mm-hmm. And I kind, of, I kind of sensed there was an answer to to this story versus situation dilemma um, and decided to figure it out. And I watched you know hundreds of movies and I finally boiled it down to eight essential elements um, that are required in order to tell a story. And I probably somewhat put them all. I was very excited when I finally figured it out and I put this all on a one page form and glibly wrote on this form, you know, screenplay in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and hence my nutshell technique was born. Um, so it's eight essential elements that are, and here's the key is they're interrelated elements. It is not like so many of the beat sheet methods, I would call them, that are out there that sure. tell you you're supposed to hit 15 or 22, or, or I've even heard 120 pre-prescribed beats. That's right. not what this is. They're, these are not moments in time. There's really, I mean, there's two moments in time that are part of my eight elements. The other elements are not frozen moments in time. Um, 
they are part of a system, an interactive system. And, and the, the key difference is, again, it's not just unconnected moments in time. There's a connection between these parts that no one else is pointing out. And, and herein is the difference between a situation and a story. Well, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show, obviously, is because you've written one of the one of the best selling books uh, on story right now, which is called the nutshell uh, the nutshell technique. Um, so, can you kind of can can you go into those eight a little bit, or at least parts of that, without giving away everything? Sure. sure. Well, you know, I am going to actually give away everything uh, for you know your listeners can download the nutshell technique worksheet. Awesome. It's going to be. Yeah, it's going to be um, in the show notes, and I, actually, I can even tell you, I think it's jillchamberlain.com slash worksheet. I'll put uh, it in the show notes to make sure yeah. everybody gets it. Yeah, you can download. This is this is my method. That These are the two nutshell t- technique forms, they're, and they're worksheets mm-hmm. for um, uh, figuring out your story. And it's so much easier to figure it out on a one-page schematic mm-hmm. than it is when you've already done a 120 page screenplay and um, people tend to, uh, you know, they pay me good money to uh, analyze their screenplays as a script consultant. Mm-hmm. And I wish they'd come to me in the beginning and looked and started with this form because right. I don't need to read 120 pages to tell you whether or not your story works. We can actually figure it out. In fact, it's way easier to figure it out. When we're looking at these eight essential elements, we can see them right there on this visual schematic, and you can see what's working and what's not working. Well, can you go uh, in? Can you go in a little bit to those eight? Uh, those eight um, things. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll try to. It's kind of visual, so um, but I'll I'll try and hit on the I guess the main or, or a couple of the the elements that are involved. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I divide stories in the two forms. One is for comedy and one is for tragedy. And, and when I, I'm using the word comedy, I'm not talking about the genre of, ha, you know, ha-ha comedy. Um, I'm, I, these are the original definitions, and you can blame Aristotle if you want to blame someone. <laughs> the, those are his definitions. Oh, the, oh that guy. That guy, um, that guy who told us more about story structure yep. than than the sum total of, of all the books that have been written since then. Yes, um, and I I also make it easy for you. You don't have to read Aristotle, which is not an easy read. Uh, I, I discuss in uh, my opening chapters the Aristotelian principles behind it um, mm-hmm. and, and how it comes from Aristotle. But at the at the most basic form, uh, a story is going to involve a, a protagonist, one protagonist. Um, so, and I'll mention, even if it's an ensemble picture, one of the characters is a protagonist. Now this could be the writer's secret, by the way, Mm -hmm. this is, this is for the writer to know the audience doesn't have to know this. The audience can think it's a buddy picture or an ensemble picture and not worry about who the protagonist is. It's going to be real helpful though, for the writer to know who is truly the protagonist and, and that, that character's journey is going to be the backbone and uh so the nutshell technique if it's a comedy structure that means uh basically uh, it doesn't mean haha comedy but it does mean a happy ending um and it means that the character has changed and learned and gone 180 degrees from an initial flaw to its opposite strength um and that and all i've said right now is literally from Aristotle. That's Aristotle. Um, now, what my technique does is point out a couple other Aristotelian um, elements that come into play. That um, one of the things of, of making sure you're telling a story instead of present a situation. That was something actually Aristotle talked about. He referred to it as, as episodic, actually, as we would too. But the best stories are are ones that are not episodic where there's a logic it's not just an un, unconnected event but there's a logic between the events okay. um, so that's among the things we're going to be setting up that it is um it is there's a reason why we're putting this character on uh uh this journey um and it makes it uh inherent that that character is the protagonist and uh and it wouldn't be for a different character. 
Um, and there's certain moments that are going to be are specifically designed. Um, so, for example, the uh, break into Act Two, which goes by a, a bunch of you can hear a couple of different ways that people refer to that. And the term I use is the point of no return. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea is that contained in that point of no return is a the characters getting two things. They're getting something they really want. So um, uh, Michael Dorsey in Tootsie wants an acting job. He gets that in the point of no return where he gets the soap opera, uh, uh, the part of the soap opera. But there's, he gets something he doesn't want, and that's the catch. Um, and the catch is going to be this perfect – and the catch is he has to dress up as a woman. Right, and that's going to be a female character, and that's going to be the perfect test of his flaw, which is that he doesn't respect women. So, those are the, I just encompassed a few of the, the eight elements there: the want, the point of no return, the catch, and the flaw. That's four of the eight right there. Mm -hmm. And part of this method is about figuring out what are you married to. Like in the beginning, we've got a bunch of plot, we've got a character idea, and maybe some different plot things bouncing around in our head, some of which probably have, um, contradict each other, but in our mind, we think they're working. And, and this is forcing you to start to put the, some of these on paper and, and figure out, what am I really married to? Am I really married to this premise of a guy who gets a part on a soap where he's going to have to dress up as a woman? Or am I married to a flaw of, and maybe we had a different flaw initially, that the flaw is that he is arrogant, which is actually one of Michael's flaws, but it's not the nutshell flaw. That flaw doesn't particularly work with the specific catch of the fact that he has to dress as a woman. Mm -hmm. That happens to be the perfect test of someone whose flaw is they don't respect women. Um, so I, I feel it's going to be, a, I'm, I'm describing something that is a lot easier actually for your, your listeners when they, they will see the form. It's very visual, you know, and it almost looks like a, a graphic novel. Right. We designed the form. And, and in my book, I have 30 examples of movies in the back, of, uh, just every, all on this identical form. Everything from Casablanca to The Godfather to Pulp Fiction to Silver Linings Playbook, all used to The Big Lebowski, all use this identical structure. Um, and yeah, so the, the, the goal is to help writers make sure they don't. So what I found was that 99% of writers fail to tell a story. Um, 99% of screenwriters present a situation. And now, can you, can you make it, can you, can you explain the difference between a situation and a story in, yeah. in, in some, so, so we can kind of get an idea? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I wrote a whole book about it to, to, <laughs> to you know, get into the de details of it, but I can, uh, uh, a couple ways I can briefly kind of give you an overview is life is a situation. Mm -hmm. Life is this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. That's not a story. Story is this happens, which leads to that happening, which makes it ironic when this thing happens, et cetera. There's a connection between the parts. Um, and another way to look at it, it would be, if I can take your protagonist out mm -hmm. of your plot and put a completely different one in, and maybe with a couple of tweaks, it works just as well, that's a situation. That's not a story. A story, I shouldn't be able to do that. A story should be unique to the protagonist. Um, one example I like to give uh, often in my workshops is, you know, I was talking about Tootsie. 99% uh, of writers, the writers who are failing to tell a story, are, are writing what I would call fat Tootsie. Mm -hmm. Fat Tootsie is, let's imagine we have the exact same plot of the movie Tootsie, um, Michael Dorsey, out of work actor, desperate for an acting job. He gets a part on a soap opera, but I'm going to make a change. Instead of him getting a part as a woman, uh, he's going to get a part of a man. But the man is uh, the male character is supposed to be an obese man in this fictional soap opera world. Hmm. And Michael, Michael really wants this part, so he's going to get a makeup artist friend and a costumer to make him a fat suit and prosthesis, so he can 
pretend that he's actually a, a fat man. Um, and he's going to get the part. It would almost, it's very similar to the real Tootsie. It almost works as well. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we tend to find it funny when, when a, uh, a guy uh, 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 is trying to uh, pretend to be a woman. It could equally be funny to have a little guy like Dustin Hoffman pretending to be a big fat guy. And he's got to get in and out of his fat suit and he grows to hate it. And, you know, finally at the climax, he's going to pull off his fat suit and reveal he's little Dustin Hoffman. It almost works, but Fat Tootsie is a situation. It's got nothing to do with the character of Michael Dorsey. Mm. Michael Dorsey, who doesn't respect women, right? So the, we put the character in an arbitrary plot that sounds, sounds like it could be amusing, but without making sure there's a connection between these eight elements, you've got a situation and not a story. Yeah, because it basically... The, I mean, even if you made him into like a character who hates fat people, has a big uh-huh. problem with fat people, it doesn't ring as powerful as a man who disrespects women and now has to be a woman to to get to the point where he wants to go. Um, yeah, it, but if we change that flaw, if we did change the flaw, it would be much closer to a story, wouldn't it? It'd be a little bit. It would. It would be right. a little closer, but not as powerful or as funny as mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. A, a guy in drag as throughout mm-hmm. cinematic history has shown us. Right, right, but I, I, I think actually it, it could potentially work as well. Yes. The problem is ninety nine percent of writer are, write, are writing fat tootsie. They're they're writing, um, they're putting their character in an arbitrary situation mm. that's not that has nothing to do with the character, inner character, and, and that's one of the biggest flaws. The biggest flaws you can have as a screenwriter is not understanding that difference. Well, the so so if I understand you correctly. You focus a lot more on the character and, and, and as far as their journey through the story as opposed to the story itself. It, 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 it's a very um, symbiotic relationship as it should be where the plot is helping the character develop and vice versa as opposed to a lot of stories that are either all plot driven where you could kind of replace the the main character almost and it doesn't really matter. Um, or it's all character driven and there's no plot and it's just kind of meandering throughout the story, if you call it that. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, I would say though that for something to truly meet the definition of a story, or at least the one I'm trying to use mm-hmm. in story versus situation, character and plot are not separate. Mm-hmm. That there are specific inter, inter, intersections between the two that you must hit um, in order for you to successfully t- tell a, a story. Otherwise, um, so you could have a great uh, character with a great character arc, but you didn't develop the right plot to test that character. You still have a situation. So it doesn't matter if you're if it's character driven or it's plot driven. You could end up with a situation. For it to be a story that there are very specific inter- – these two things are interconnected and, and, and necessarily so. So the problem with the situation is both with people – you know, it isn't, um, it isn't subject just to one or – a plot approach or a character approach. Uh, either one, if you, you are going to fall into that trap if you don't – find these these intersections between the two which I, what i like about your technique is that unlike let's say the standard joseph campbell's hero's journey you can't attach that to every story i mean if you try to do the hero's journey mm-hmm. on a detective story it, it doesn't work nearly as well as it does on an adventure movie um but your technique can actually be placed on every kind of story because it is in, integral to storytelling with the symbiotic yeah. relationship of plot and character. Yeah, right. So it gets down to the, the, the definition of a story and it's not limited by genre. I, I went to great efforts in the book to include, you know, every genre and every time period, you know, uh, uh, in the history of film to show how universal great storytelling can be. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, um, uh, the matrix or, uh, August Osage County, Mm-hmm. Um, both of those have a, have a great story uh, element uh, that because they, they they have all eight of these elements and they have those proper interconnections that make them a story, not a situation. 
when you start writing, where would you start with the the character or the story, and 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 then how do they interact? How do they? When do you bring the other one in? Well, I think it depends on the writer. I, I tend to be a premise, I, and I think both approaches are valid. I, mm-hmm. I, I, if I can sort of lump writers into two large categories, I would say there are those who are are premise. They start with the premise. What if somebody woke up and it was the same day again? Mm-hmm. Great, um, great movie, <laughs> right? And, and I tend to be a premise person. I start with you know the idea. What's what you know? What if this happened? Um, and then I try to figure out, well, what would be the most interesting character to put on that journey, right? You know, if you made the mistake of putting the Rita character, the, the love interest in uh, the Andy McDowell. Gr- yeah, Groundhog Day. In right. Groundhog Day, making her the protagonist, we would lose the emotional – it would, again, be a situation, not a story. Uh, because her, it's not – test. It's, it's not – she doesn't have a flaw that is, is – that this – journey of being stuck repeating the same day is a good one to repeat. I would say her flaw is something like she's a little naive. That's not a, that's not really going to be tested by having to repeat the same day every day. It happens to be a great test for somebody who's a selfish prick. Right. right? Cause that's going to, you know, it's going to get tiresome it, just doing that. And he's going to have to, um, it's going to force him to finally become a better person. Um, now, there are other people who I think start with a character. I think that's a valid way to start. You know, what if I had a guy who's a, uh, a jerk um, uh, weather man who thinks he's better than everybody else? Huh, what would be an interesting journey to put him on that would test that? Right. I think it's a little harder to stumble upon the great premise second. So I tend to be the other way. But, I, but both are valid ways to work. I mean, it would, like Rocky, you know, what if there was a bum who got a shot at the title and, mm-hmm. and he just wanted to go all the way? Mm-hmm. That starts basically. It's it is it is a premise, but you're starting with Rocky. Yeah, yeah. And then you're working the story along the line, the plot along that way. So it does have. I mean, I don't know where Stallone started. If he started with, I think he did. If I remember correctly, in interviews, he started with Rocky. He's like, what if that guy got a shot? Yeah, probably. What if I that- would guess. Yeah, I would guess so too. Yeah. Well, and I think it all comes down to ultimately they are. If if you succeed in telling a story. That there are, it's almost po- impossible to separate them. You know, like, it's kind of hard to tell in the Rocky example which one, you know, we can guess, and I think it's a pretty good guess that he started with the character. Um, but they are, you know, what makes it unique is not about a underdog, you know, trying for a, a title. That's not particularly unique. It's mm-hmm. this guy doing it that makes it unique. Right, exactly. And if you start going through the Rocky movies, uh, if we're using if we're going down the Rocky t- terminology, as I'm thinking, each movie he is tested and and changes in different ways. But it's always surrounded around Rocky, uh, mm-hmm. as opposed to um, I don't know what's a, what uh, where the situation's bigger than the character. Sometimes almost mm-hmm. like Jurassic Park, almost yeah, or like Star or the Star Wars or, series. Where it's not it, just what about it's not just about Luke. Right. You know? It's about a thousand things going on yeah. at the same time. Um, yeah. Now, as a screenwriter, in your opinion, how do you surprise the audience? Uh, you know, what is that thing that just that because we're so savvy as as uh, audience members now, we consume so much content. We've consumed over a hundred years now mm-hmm. of cinema, not to mention television. You know, things that worked in the Casablanca days do not work today. How do you surprise your audience? Yeah. Well, I'll give you, I'll, I'll try and sum up one of my best uh, tips out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, so it's where we really want to be surprised is in the climax, right? The, the, that, that event that starts off our, our act three. Um, and cause that's what everyone paid their money for, by the way, you know, it, it you know, typical uh, climax probably only lasts literally two minutes, mm-hmm. but that, that's, we all came to see that climax. Um, so and that's the real struggle is to find a surprising climax. Um, it, it is has often been said that a, a great um, uh, ending is inevitable yet unexpected. <laughs> uh, and when they say that the ending, they really mean climax. So the, you know, the climax is inevitable yet unexpected. That's a pretty tall order, by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a pretty tall order, but that's our goal. Um, so a movie like, for example, yeah, Tootsie, if you saw it, especially if you saw it in 
today, if you saw it today, it, it probably wouldn't be as surprising. But if you saw it in, in movie theaters, when he live on the air reveals he's a man, you never saw that coming. That's the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Once you see that, you can't imagine the movie any other way. That's the inevitable. Um, so here's my best advice, okay, about how to find your inevitable yet unexpected climax, how to find your surprising ending. Uh, right before the climax of the movie, your protagonist typically is going to be at their lowest place. Um, and you really want them between a rock and a hard place. Um, you know, you can't have them between a rock and a soft place because then we'll, we'll know they're going to choose soft place or if they don't choose soft place, we're not going to buy. They've got to be between a rock and a hard place. Pressure. Two, Pressure. Two, two bad choices. Two right. terrible choices they don't want to take. All right. So now we're beginning at three. they got to make a choice. So what are they going to choose? Are they going to choose rock? Are they going to choose hard place? No, they're going to choose, and now I'm going to tell you a very t important technical term I, I use with my writers. They're not going to choose rock. They're not going to choose hard place. They're going to choose banana. <laughs> banana. That is my technical term. We use. I, we literally use that in my workshops. We want to find the banana. It's not a rock. It's not a hard place. It's not even the same family. Right? It's not even a mineral. Mm -hmm. um, so when Michael Dorsey pulls off the, uh, off the uh, wig and reveals he's uh, actually a man underneath that, it's, it had nothing, it had no direct, uh, we did not see that coming because his two bad choices before that were either continue on the show, which he's miserable about because his love interest won't even speak to him, or deal with some sort of legal nightmare. Um, uh, when he picks banana, we didn't see that coming. So that is your, that is my best advice to your writers about how to find your, your surprising ending is try to find an unexpected third choice. Um, and, and that is easier said than done. Um, you don't want it to come completely out of nowhere. So it, it they set it up in some ways that sometimes that soap opera goes live and they have to, they have to, uh, 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 ad lib lines on the spot, and so that we believe that, but they hid that well enough that we did not see. We did not see that as an option that he was suddenly going to change the whole soap opera and um, you know, and uh, uh, change the lines and claim that he was uh, a male character underneath the female character. So finding something that just comes out of left field in many ways. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be a little careful calling it left field in that just because, you know, we don't want, you know, dos ex machina. It's not, right, yeah, of it's, course. Right, yeah, of it's course. not some external thing that suddenly saves the day. It's something they're going to find in with themselves mm -hmm. that that um, we didn't see coming. But at the same time, it has to have an emotional, satisfying uh, logic to it, right? You can't, you can't have the characters... By you know, I hesitate with left field just because you know, we don't want the character suddenly doing something out of character, quote unquote. Well, it's kind of like it's kind of like Luke in Star Wars. Like he he decides to use the Force, which comes out of mm -hmm. left field, mm -hmm. but it completely makes sense for the journey that he's been on. But most yeah. people, no, most people who saw that movie uh, never saw it coming. Like what? What? Like at yeah, the end of the been, day, it comes out of nowhere. Yeah, he's been resisting it. Um, uh, Forever, right? And and um, I'll, 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 just another random example of a movie that just has such a great climax for me. Um, you know, Flight. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, the Robert Zemeckis uh, film with uh, Denzel. Right. What a wonderful climax that movie has. Where two, you never saw that coming. We go into that. We go. We're going into that hearing, and we think rock and hard place. We think the bad choices are. Is he going to get nailed by them and mm -hmm. and you know found guilty, or is he going to get away with that? Mm -hmm. Those are the two choices we think that there are. And when he goes in, they suddenly make him out to be a hero, and but they're going to pin the blame on, on his lover, Katrina, who's dead, by the way, and won't go to prison. But, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he, he could totally get off scot-free. Mm -hmm. But we could see it in his face. We never saw it coming before that moment, but we totally, by, and of course, it's a great performance by Denzel on top of that. In that moment, we can see it on his face. It's like the most important lie of his whole life. And he's been lying his whole life, right? He, he said that 
two seconds before he went in there, the lawyer said, you know, it's, 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 it's coaching him. And he said, so don't tell me how to lie about my drinking. I've been lying about my drinking for 20 years. You know, he's been lying. This is the easy, he doesn't even have to lie, by the way. He could just say, when the woman says, you know, says to him, you know, who do you think was responsible for the vodka bottles? Was it Katrina? He could just say, I don't know, you know, or I don't have an opinion. He can't even do that. And you can see it on his face. It's the easiest lie he's ever been asked to do. The most important one lie he's ever been asked to do, but he can't do it. And so, it's, and that's unexpected, but it's also very fitting in the character where we can, we felt this inner conflict that he hasn't even been in touch with right. the fact of this, his denial of his culpability of what's happened. Got it. Now, let me ask you a question because you work with a lot of writers. What is the main difference between professional and amateur writers? Uh, I, I, number one, I would say the story versus situation. I got to tell you, 99% of writers, of amateur screenwriters, are, are time and time again are presenting a situation. It's an arbitrary plot. It may be a, an interesting plot. It may be a clever plot, but it's arbitrary. It's got nothing to do with that character. Can you, can you, can you, can you give me an example of a movie that does a situation that's in the, in the mainstream? If you, if you can, like, that's why it didn't work. Um, maybe that's a situation. Surprisingly few professional movies actually get to that point. Even, even, even studio. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there are. It's a little off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I, 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 I hate to say it, but I'm trying to think of something like Justice League, which was such a mm -hmm. horrible fop. I mm -hmm. wonder if, I mean, there's yeah, some, I some of those characters you could just pull out of there and no yeah. one would care. I, I didn't see it, but I think that is a, one of the problems with a lot of superhero movies is that they are, they're episodic, right? That, and and right. That's, that is not, um, and that's another way to say situational. So they're not focused so much on telling a satisfying story, but in setting up a sequel. Right, exactly. So you could, you know, exchange one hero for another yeah. and it would be fine because the plot will take them, you know, they'll fight the villain, they'll do all that stuff. But that's why the Nolan Batmans were so powerful and so well done because every everything was about the character of Batman. It was character driven. Everything. Yeah. I mean, a big difference. And yeah. Dark Knight probably being probably one of the best written superhero genre films ever was because it was a perfect mirror. The Joker was such a perfect mirror to his yeah. Batman in every which way from chaos right. to structure and, and so on and so forth. So it's so brilliantly done, but you're right. And, and when you start watching, so, cause I watch all the, I, I'm a big superhero movie fan, Marvel and, and mostly Marvel. Um, you see, did you see the movie Logan? I didn't see Logan. Logan, arguably one of the best written mm. One also one of the best written superhero movies that come out last year. It was amazing, but it was all about what that story. Did. You could not pull Logan out of that story and replace it. Where you could do that with some Marvel movies and some other superhero movies. Yeah, um, and I, I gotta say, I'm not a big, huge fan of superhero movies um, because I find them because of that issue that, that we're talking about. But yeah. also, I find them so predictable, especially that third act. Yeah. There's, a, uh, there's always know, a villain that comes from the sky. <laughs> you know, and, and they're going to, you know, they're going to um, finally uh, defeat him in the same kind of way. And I, I argue, I, you know, and I understand people love super, superhero movies. People want to see superhero movies. They want to see movie stars. They want to see big special effects. Sure. And they make a lot of money. I would argue they could do that amount of business plus 10% if they added the depth to it. If they did find the surprising third act. That they could bring in people like me more consistently. Well, I mean, uh, you look at but you look at the Dark Knight. You had no uh -huh. idea how that was going to go. Yeah, uh -huh. you have no idea. Like what the joke? Like uh -huh. how was that going to end? You had no idea, and it was uh -huh. so brilliantly written. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I consulted on a, on a superhero movie uh, recently, like a hundred fifty million dollar movie, and I, I really worked to try to add irony in some of the concepts for my book and try to make it less predictable. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I found I could not successfully uh, get any headway though on, on the less 
uh, predictable third act. That part, I, I couldn't seem to make any grounds, uh, get it anywhere with the powers that be about that. Now, let me ask you a question. In your opinion, without getting yourself in trouble, what, what, why do you think that's the case? Because it just feel that that's just a formula that's working and they don't want to mess with it? I think so. I think they're afraid they'll... I think, and I think they're wrong. Uh, they're afraid they'll somehow hurt their base if they have uh, more depth. Where, and like I said, my argument is you could do all the business you're doing plus ten percent mm-hmm. if you if you had some more depth to it. That's that's my opinion. Now, in your opinion, today we have this binge watching effect uh, that we're just now because of streaming and because of watching shows so much. How does that affect writers in today's world? Well, are you talking, I mean, that's really a product of television. Right? Yeah, more you're episodic and more episodic. episodic. Yeah. Because, I mean, you look at a show like uh, Breaking Bad, which mm-hmm. had a beautiful arc over five seasons. Um, that's a very different kind of storytelling. Does the nutshell technique work within television or is it strictly for cinema? Yeah, it does work with television. I I have not unleash this to the public yet um but i am in the process of developing it for television now because it 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 does work absolutely for television and um uh it's uh but there's so i think there's a lot more variety in the types of uh, there's so much more variety particularly in recent years you know where uh you know it's not just your sitcom anymore, you know, or sitcom or your one hour dramas. Now we have, you know, we have anthology series. We, you know, we have series, uh, rare instances of like something like breaking bad where they actually planned out the ending. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you have more open-ended, most much more are going to be open-ended, right? You have no idea. I mean, even breaking bad had no idea how, how many years they'd be renewed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there are a lot of different, uh, approaches as far as, looking at it season and series wise. Um, but I will tell you the nutshell technique applies per episode. I'm mm-hmm. seeing these same eight elements in good episodic television. You know, for years, I think people have said, well, but the characters don't change in TV, certainly not in an episode, maybe over the course of a season. Mm-hmm. I, I got to tell you, they do, you know, the pilot episode, we think of breaking bad, right. It's, it's famously about a, a good man who becomes a bad man. Right. Mm-hmm. Very first episode, very first, the pilot episode, he goes from being meek to in that same episode, um, uh, becoming quite assertive by the end of it. Right. Uh, Running around in his underwear with a gun and a a Winnebago in the middle of the desert with meth in there. (laughs) Yeah. And even, you know, just like making this very passionate, it ends with him, you know, very passionately making love to his wife, you know, when she asks, where have you been? You know, and she's like, who are you? Right. (laughs) That's in the very first episode that that happened. As, as your dog uh, he agrees. Yeah. <laughs> she, she agrees. <laughs> so let me ask you, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests. Um, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Write, learn story. Um, learn how to write um, uh, story and write Screenplays, and you got to write lots of them. Too many people think that um, to break into the business, that the business is looking for screenplays. Mm-hmm. That's a, it's actually kind of a myth. They're looking for screenwriters, right? A screenwriter doesn't just have one screenplay. How how attractive is it going to be to somebody, you know, uh, a manager who's going to make all of, you know, if you option your first screenplay, uh, that means you'll make about $4,000, they'll make about $400, right? A big whopping 400 bucks. Right. You know, right. It's going to buy them lunch in Hollywood. How attractive <laughs> is the writer who has one screenplay versus the writer who has six? Okay. Right. Good, 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 good yeah. tip. Um, right. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Um. One that really changed the way I look at things, uh, it's, it's, the book's out of print, although you might be able to get it via Amazon or something, uh, is a book called The Elements of Cinema. It's by uh, a, a fellow uh, named uh, Stefan Sharp, who, Sharp, uh, S-H-A-R-F-F, 
Um, and I actually had him as a professor when I was at Columbia, mm-hmm. and he blew my mind. Um, I, you know, I took this class. I was actually a, a freshman. Uh, I had never considered structure in film before. Even I loved movies, but I, I never considered structure. Never really paid attention to. I mean, I knew movies were edited, but I and you know that were there were wide shots and close up, but I, I never paid attention to how they were put together. And he really pulled back the curtain. Um, and, uh, I think it's a big part of what got, what got me to having my deconstructive nature of trying to deconstruct, you know, what works with story and, and things like that to try to, um, pull back the curtain and, um, par- parse it out. Okay. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Uh, uh, perfectionism is not your friend. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to get it done. And what are three of your favorite films of all time? Ah, well, okay. Um, Paper Moon. Yeah, it's a good uh, film. Like, uh, I, I would say it's a masterpiece. And, yeah. and I know you have uh, you know, screenwriters. It, it's great for story. Directors should really take note. It is, a, it is really a masterfully directed movie. Um, uh, it, it just, in particular, I think writers to look at that first act and how information is doled out, how the story unfolds, mm-hmm. um, and really that how that first, the very first scene, you know, the protagonist is a con man. We don't know that yet. He's a con man who shows up at this funeral and uh, without any dialogue, uh, he, he comes approaches this graveside funeral. He steals some flowers off of another grave to present them. That is that is just wonderfully delicious screenwriting right there. And it's in the script, by the way, I checked. Um, mm-hmm. the, the stealing of the flowers. It tells us everything we need to know about this guy, right? He's a con man. We know, we know right off the bat. But he also means well at times. Mm-hmm. He's a con man with a heart. Con man with a heart, yeah. Oh, and you said three movies. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, next one is The Verdict. Um, oh, yeah. Paul Newman. Yeah. You ever hear your protagonist is supposed to be likable? <laughs> right? Look right. at this guy. Right? So he's not even, you know, you've heard of ambulance chasing con men, uh, lawyers. He crashed, another funeral crasher. He crashes funerals. He's a hearse chasing lawyer. Um, he's a hardcore alcoholic. He's a liar. He lies throughout the movie. He hits women. Um, I mean, you, it's it's hard to imagine a, a, a protagonist, uh, you know, played by Paul Newman of all people, you know, um, that could be more unlikable on paper. Right. But even this guy deserves redemption, and that's the theme. And by the end, we're totally on this guy's side. Um, to me, that's really powerful screenwriting. Okay. It's it's easy to get us to root for a nice guy. But right. to get us to like a son of a bitch is make a whole us, other thing. Make, yeah, to make us standing on our feet cheering for a guy who saw, you know, punch a woman in a few scenes before is kind of amazing. And what's the third one? Uh, um, Groundhog Day. Ah, such a brilliant yeah. film. And another another great example of unlikable character. You know, he, right. there's no, there's nothing. He's funny, but other than that, there's nothing likable about him. And um, frankly, it wouldn't work if he was likable. Right, exactly. If he was a really nice guy who just get thrown into the situation, people would be like, oh, "Who cares?" But because yeah. he's such a sob in the in yeah. the movie, I mean, he is. He's funny, but other than that, he really is a horrible person. He's a pretty horrible person, yeah. <laughs> so, and it was, you know, you'll see a theme here in, in my favorite movies: unlikable characters. You you, you do yourself a real disservice um, if you're focusing on that. Um, it's a much more interesting feat to get us to like a character who starts out as unlikable. Now, do you think in today's studio world that a film with an unlikable protagonist that's not being written by someone who's established or doesn't have a big star attached to it has a chance? I do. Okay. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I think it has a good chance because if you do, if it can do it, if you can pull it off, right. um, it's you're going to it's going to be much more memorable. Think about how much more, you know, how many how many nice guy protagonists um, screenplays just do the gatekeepers see from new people trying to break in and how how likely is that going to be memorable versus someone who's unlikable. 
it, um, oh, it, just, it just had on the tip of my tongue the question. Um, if they're unlikable, um, okay, I lost I lost my train of thought completely. I had a great question and it just flew out of my head. This is what happens <laughs> as you get older. Um, but but uh, thank you so much, Jill, for being on the show. I really, really appreciate it. And where can people find you and your book and everything you have to offer? Yeah. Uh, so uh, jillchamberlain.com is my main website, and I, I do script consultation you know, worldwide via Skype. Uh, um, my book is uh, The Nutshell Technique, Crack the Secret of Successful Screenwriting. It's going to be on you know, Amazon and some of your finer bookstores. Oh, by the way, I recommend the paperback instead of the Kindle because I've got those big nutshell diagrams uh, and it's a larger format book. Um, and with the Kindle, you, you're stuck with that little, you know, two inch. Uh, my beautiful <laughs> diagrams are, are shrunk down to two inches there. Got it. Uh, and um, I also do, I split my time between LA and Austin, Texas, where I do group workshops. Uh, and that's I, my group workshop um, uh, website is the screenplayworkshop.org. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'll, you'll also find me on, on Twitter and, and Facebook under my name. Jill, thanks again so much for sharing your nutshell technique with the audience. And uh, I, it, it really does make you think a little bit differently about story, which is our goal at the podcast, to trying to make you think a little bit differently when you're writing your stories. So thank you so much. Great. My, it's been my pleasure. Enjoyed it. I want to thank Jill for dropping some major knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you, Jill, so much for taking out the time. And I hope you guys learned a little bit about her technique in regards to how to crack the secret of a successful story. Now, if you want links to uh, her book, The Nutshell Technique, or anything else we discussed in this episode, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS023. And if you haven't already, please head over to ScreenwritingPodcast.com and leave us a good review. It really helps the show out a lot. And the show has been growing leaps and bounds. So thank you all for listening and for all the support. And I'm so glad that I'm able to provide some value to the screenwriting community and all those filmmakers who are writing their own screenplays. I'm so glad I could be of service to you guys. And as always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y.com. 